the burden that I feel for the manifold things that are in this house when we come together are sometimes heavy. And when those times come, I know that what I'm feeling is not of God. And the reason I know is because the word is clear that his burden is easy and his yoke, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So if you're carrying a burden that's heavy, throw it off. It's not of God because every burden that God gives is light. And when you cast off the heavy burdens, you can see clearly the burden of the Lord because there are things he wants us to say and do. And the enemy distracts us from that when we're loaded down. And that's where heaviness, that's how a spirit of heaviness enters in. But we're not ignorant of his devices. And he's making us wise so that we can do all that's in his mind for us to do. I want you to confess with your mouth that every burden I carry, say it, is light. Every heavy burden I cast off because it's not of God. Amen, because his burdens are light. Our text is in 1 Samuel 16, and I just want to briefly encourage and hopefully inspire everyone who's ever been looked over, everyone who's toiled behind the scenes and seems to get no credit, and it seems that nobody recognizes what you do, I want you to know that God sees you. I understand because I've been there. And I know that many of you have been there. I want to encourage you in this text. Father, we pray today that you would speak a word. One word from you is more than all the sermons that can ever be preached. God, this is not a time for a sermon. This is a time for a word from you. God, deliver us, deliver us all from wanting to be in the spotlight, for wanting it to be about us. God, there are times we do it unconsciously. Convict us, remind us that it's not about us, it's about you, because we have nothing that we have not received. And so today, I pray that you would arrest your servant by the Holy Ghost, that the excellency of the power might be of you and not of me. Reign me in now. Reign me in, I beseech you, even in the areas where I'm ignorant. God, let your spirit break forth in Jesus' name. Amen. And all who agree with me, give God a hand clap. First Samuel 16, verse 1 says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? It's interesting that the prophet is mourning and Saul isn't dead. This lets us know there's a type of mourning even for the living. And mourning takes us to a low place. He's a prophet of God who the Bible says that God never let one of his words fall to the ground. That means whatever came out of Samuel's mouth came to pass 100% of the time. And yet, he's mourning. He's mourning Saul because he had to deliver a harsh prophetic word from God to him that God had rent or tore the kingdom from him because he disobeyed God. 
And he said to him something that is often quoted. He says, to obey, obedience is better than sacrifice. And to obey is better than much offering. And so he's now mourning, and God said, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Reigning over Israel. I said, God, how many people have you rejected who are still sitting in positions of power? God had rejected Saul, but Samuel, a prophet of God, who heard from God as a child, was afraid that Saul would kill him. He said, I can't go over there. He's going to kill me. He's in a position of power and God has left him. One of the problems that we face in our society and sometimes even in our homes, there are people of influence and power whom God has rejected. Now, in order for Saul to be rejected, he had to first be accepted. And he, be, he came to be king because the people wanted to be like everybody else. Be careful what you pray for. And God told the prophet to tell him, he's going to reign over your, you, your, your sons and your daughters are going to be his servants. Nope, we want to be like everybody else. Young people, God is saying, in that day, that was the lure of popular culture. The people of God wanted to be like the world. The people of God wanted to be like everybody else. And I can't tell you how many times in the bowels of my soul, I weep at the things that I see creeping in, that I recognize from other places, and they're entering in to the people of God because we desire the stuff that we see around us. And God was saying, am I not enough? Am I not enough? The, the only reason God did this is because the people were unrelenting and he gave them what they wanted. So the people rejected God. And now the king they prayed for, God is rejecting. And he said, fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I provided myself. This time, I'm not doing it for the people. I'm providing myself a king. And sometimes when God does something for himself, he doesn't do it based on how people look for the part. There's some folk who look the part, but they're not the ones that God is looking for because he sees you and he sees me from the inside out. The world sees the outside, so they want credentials. I heard about um, uh, parliament in the UK and they said there's, a, there's an Anglican pastor who said no matter who's voted in, no matter who's voted out, for hundreds of years nothing has changed. Nothing has changed in our nation. He said there are I think 90% of the people in parliament come from two schools. He said, the system is rigged. And I thought, wow, now that's evidence that the system is rigged from two places. He said, you can't get in. So the people have no voice. And he said, the one time we had a chance to voice our view, we decided to leave Europe. And I thought, that's deep to hear an insight. We decided to leave Europe 
and go on our own. And he said to the people in the room, do you know that the number one source of income that we have comes from Europe? So now you go on your own and you don't even realize this is what you asked for, that you're vulnerable. Because if I know in a business negotiation that you're vulnerable, you just made me strong. Because I know you have no leverage. So when I negotiate with you, you're not going to get stronger, you're going to get weaker. And the people decided that that's what they wanted. But you don't realize what you're getting until you get it. And so it was with the people of Israel. But God is so good that he corrects our mistakes. He knows how to make up for our insufficiency. And so he says, I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears, he'll kill me. He doesn't even have to see me. If he hears about this, he'll kill me. So here's what I want to say to encourage somebody. It doesn't mean you're not anointed if something that confronts you makes you fearful. But never run away from it. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's action in the presence of fear. You know that you trust God that even when I'm afraid, I'm going to go because God told me to go. Samuel was a prophet whose prophecies were accurate all the time. And he said to God, if he hears about that, he's going to kill me. He's talking to God. So in that moment, he forgot that God is able to protect him, but he recovers quickly. That's the thing about a real prophet. You're going to see Samuel made a few missteps but he wouldn't take the step without hearing from God. I learned a lesson there because you can avoid so many mistakes by not going with what's in your head and then moving on it. You ought to wait and hear what God has to say about it. Even though he was on assignment, he would have made a mistake if God didn't speak in his ear. So Jesse, he comes to town and he's on his way to Jesse's house. And the elders of the town are afraid because Bethlehem is a small little community. Samuel is now up in age, and they know he doesn't travel this far without something. And he's got a heifer and oil, a horn of oil. He's here on God's business. So they're thinking, what did we do now? And before he enters in, they run and say, do you come in peace? What they were really asking is, what did, why did God send you here? Why to Bethlehem? We're, we're only a little people. Why didn't God send you to Judah? Go, go to Israel. Go somewhere else. And he said, I come peaceably. And the elders relaxed. So he took his instruments of sacrifice and anointing and went to Jesse's house. And Jesse, who had eight sons, only thought about seven of them to bring seven. And I want to say to everybody who's been overlooked, who feels like the least, God sees you. And God, you're the type that God prepares for himself because you're only entangled with his business. What you're doing may feel, look, and seem to be menial or lowly, but God is preparing you for greater works. He had David mining, stinking, dumb sheep. Sheep are not the most intelligent, and they don't smell good. Have you ever been in the presence of sheep? I didn't hear a lot of yeses. You ought to take a field trip. Where, where I grew up, there was a slaughterhouse. And we were, how would my mother say it? 
bad kids. <laughs> and me and my friends, we would go down to the slaughterhouse. Sometimes we would watch what happened. There were days, literally, they had to lock down the schools because bulls would be running the streets. And they're like, how did they escape? I'm thinking, it's probably Ned did that. But we would see the sheep. We would see the, um, the cows, the bulls. But the stench in that place was bad. And if you went in there and went home, it wasn't difficult to discern where you had been because it gets on you. But David, every day, did it. And it was his father's sheep. And his father, what did his other brothers do? Look closely at this text when you get home and then tell me what his other brothers did. There's no mention of what they did. They probably did important stuff. We do know from chapter 17 that they were in the army because when David came, they tried to stop him. They were in the army, but apparently they weren't fighting because when Goliath came, those brothers cut some timber getting through the woods. But he brings the first son, Iliad, and here what the prophet says when this first son is brought forward to him. In verse 6, so it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, surely, somebody say surely, the Lord's anointed is before him. Why would he say surely? He was tall, he probably was dressed nice. He looked like someone who ought to be king. But a king doesn't look like a king. A king is a king. A president is a president. A governor is a governor when God puts them in that place. Psalm 75 and 5 says promotion comes neither from the, from the south, the east, or the west. It is God who judges. He puts down one and he puts up another. Promotion comes from God. So then he says, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Now God said, I'm going to anoint the one who I named for you. Did God name Iliad? So the prophet got ahead of God. But here's the lesson for all of us. We can be corrected if we just wait and listen. Do, but the Lord said to Samuel in verse 7, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. You see the difference between rejection and refusal? He rejected Saul because Saul was in a position that God put him in. He said, I'm taking you out. I reject you. But this one, I refuse you. I'm not going to allow anybody to take this position except I personally prepare them. So he refused him. Sometimes God has saved me from myself by refusing me and refusing you. There are jobs that I thought I wanted, but when the door was being closed, it was God refusing to allow me to go in. He's like, son, this is not for you. I know that this doesn't look as glamorous, but if you'll just do that, I'll make a way. I need you to know that it's me and not you. It's not your credentials. It's not who you know. It's who you know in that you know me. So some of the things that you've been refused of, don't despise those things. It could be, it just might be, that God is setting you up for something better, for something greater. It's not just the open doors that we ought to acknowledge, it's the closed ones. Because when God closes the door, nobody else can open it. And when you try several ways and that, doors won't, that door won't open, you should realize God has done this. Let me move on. He says, the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, 
but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has, so now Samuel has got it. Nope, the Lord hasn't chosen him because he hasn't told me. He goes through all seven. And then the prophet has to ask, is there another? What would have happened if the prophet didn't ask? Now I want you to think about David He's minding the sheep faithfully. They're not his sheep, it's his father's sheep. And his father doesn't appreciate what he's doing because he's the, he's the youngest. And normally, in families, the youngest is the least experienced. They're the least, you want the ones who are elder to do it. They're stronger, they're wiser, they're supposed to be. <laughs> that's not always true, I know that's not always true. but. He's the only one who's not in the circle. He's outside of the circle. If you've ever been outside of the circle, I want you to know God sees you. He sees you right where you are. David was, a, was learning how to be a faithful steward. And sheep represents God's people. It's interesting that when Moses was on the backside of the mountain, he was tending to his father-in-law Jethro's sheep. It wasn't his but God was preparing him to deliver a nation. And now here's David tending to his father, Jesse's sheep. But in both experiences, they're having an experience with God, an experience with God. Some of you are doing what appears to be something that is low. People don't respect it. Maybe they don't respect you. But I want you to know God sees you. And he's preparing you for a greater work. When Saul called for David, he said, Jesse, send your son. You know the one that minds the sheep. And I could tell by reading the text, it was condescending. But the one he's looking down on, God has anointed and taken his spirit away from them. So don't worry about the way people look at you. Just know that God sees you. And he's got a plan for you. So then Samuel said in verse 11, said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. David was an afterthought in the mind of his father. But he was the only thought in the mind of God. So for those of us who feel like afterthoughts, you need to rejoice in that because we're the only thought in God's mind. Every one of us is so special. He knows the very hairs on our head. And that's not how many hairs. He knows hair one to one million. I just said a million because I wish I had a million. And he knows even the follicles that fell the hairs on your very head are numbered. Think about a God who takes that detail. Every single one is numbered. There's no inventory management system in the earth that is as good as the God that we serve. But Jesus wants us to know how special we are in his eyes and in our Father's eyes. And Samuel said, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest, he's with the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him. We're not going to eat, we're not going to do anything until he gets here. David comes in bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Verse 13, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Anointed him in the midst of his brothers. I wonder how David's brothers thought of him. I wonder how they treated him based on how his father neglected to bring him in with everyone else. It says to me, probably not good, but he's the one that God plucked to do something that lasts until this day. Every time I look at that star that represents the nation of Israel, I remember David. It's called the star of David. When we are neglected, even by our very own, 
The Lord says, I understand because I came to my own and my own received me not. But I can give you a name. I can give you stuff that nobody else can take or give. And so the, the prophet goes and he anoints David. And the Bible says the spirit of, of the Lord came upon David that day. I want you to know in that very moment, David became king. David became king in that moment. He was 17 years old. He did not get to the throne until he was 34. So there are things that God does in me and in you that when he does it, doesn't mean it's time for you to go. It's time for you to be developed and to be prepared because David while he was looking and tending to those sheep that didn't look like much, even to the father that he was serving, God was preparing him to be a mighty warrior. God was preparing him to be a king. And, and as David went to take his brothers some stuff, even then he's still serving. His brothers are in the army, but Jesse said, take your brothers some ration. And when he went, he heard, he saw the army's running away and running away. And he said, what's going on? And his brother, Shammah said, I know you. I know what's in your heart. He said, what are you doing here? And David said, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? There's something about the spirit of God that causes us to be purpose driven. And when there's a cause, we're gonna come. God will have us in the right place at the right time. And the whole army was running away from Goliath. And David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who defies the armies of God? Now listen, David was not a member of the army. He wasn't a member of the army, but he's the only one taking up for the army because he was the only one who was anointed by God. There's something about the anointing that gives you authority. You may not have a formal position, but you have authority. They didn't know they were beholding their king, but David had the authority of God. And he had more than that. Minister Sample, he had experience with God that he got while he was tending the sheep who weren't very smart, who didn't smell good, but God was working in David something far more excellent. And so when his brother said, what are you doing? He said, listen, bruh, you don't know this, but one day when I was watching our father's sheep, a lion came to attack the sheep, and I ripped him in two with my bare hand. With my bare hands. You don't know about that because I don't tell the story. There's stuff that God has done that you don't know. You don't know my story. You don't know my story. That's why when we worship, I try to join in because you don't know what people are going through. People come every week with a story. And there's something that God wants to release. And when the people of God together lift up a sound, something happens in the midst of us. So David said... You are my brother, but you don't know this. But you need to know where my courage comes from. You're running away. I'm going to run to it because I know something about this God. I know something about this God who seems far off and distant to you. But when that lion came, I got strength in my hands from this God, and I took care of the lions. David was learning to be a faithful shepherd. He was qualifying himself to lead God's people because whoever leads God's people must be just. And so he took care of the lion. But another time, the enemy will always test you. A bear came. And the Bible says David was little. So you know what a bear is like when they stand up? David didn't run away. He didn't try to shepherd the sheep away. In fact, with the lion, he took the sheep out of his mouth. God gave him the strength to save the sheep without being injured. And a sheep doesn't resist anything. That's why God has to lead them beside the still waters. Because if the, the waters are ruffled, they won't drink it. So he prepares certain conditions. 
David took him out of his mouth, put him back in the fold, and went to that lion, ripped him in two. Probably stood over him and said, I bet you, you won't mess with nobody else's sheep. But God was developing him. What is the Lord saying to us? Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, God is preparing you for something. And the experiences that you are having will be applied. I marvel at how I look back and I say, God, now I understand why that. Because it made me ready for this. And then the bear comes and he takes the bear and he deals with him. And all the sheep, every day that David watched them, were present and accounted for. But his brothers wanted to do important stuff. They wanted to be generals. They wanted to be seen. Beloved, don't do what you do to be seen. One of the things that I discovered as I've been studying, and I want to continue to study the life of Mother Daphne, because I believe it's through consecration that the power of God is released. And as she fasted and prayed for three years, and I said, God, didn't Paul go to Arabia for three years? And you put it in her to consecrate herself for three years. She said at the end of the three years, Jesus appeared to her. And she talks in detail of what the appearance was. And he said he told her two things. Beware of prosperity, the deception, he said, of prosperity, and beware of popularity. And I said, God, we need more consecrated people because people want to be popular. People want to have a name. But God said, if you want a name, I'll give you, I'm the one who gives you a name. Don't pursue that. And he told her, when her ministry started, beware of popularity and beware of prosperity. And as I read this, she's been dead since 1967. But God has assured me that the prayer she's prayed, we're entering into that. And so that I want to learn as much about this great woman of God who birthed a prayer house in Philadelphia, we need, if you don't know your history, you won't walk into your future the right way. And so then I, I repented for the church because I said, God, there was a season where the gospel, the foundation of the gospel was prosperity. It even had a name, the prosperity gospel. But he told this great woman of God whose ministry was prayer and deliverance, beware of that. So what is the message? There are things that we can get lulled into if we are not aware. So back to David, he, he goes out and his brothers try to convince him to go back home. These are the same brothers that the prophet anointed in their presence. Let me tell you the effects of being anointed and people know that you're anointed in the presence of God. It can create some animosity. It can create some resistance. It can create jealousy. There are a lot of things. And these are his brothers who ought to support him, who ought to rejoice who ought to worship, but it, it doesn't always happen that way. When I stood here on the Saturday after being installed, and we, had a, we just happened to have a church-wide leadership meeting, and we were in the question and answer, and someone said, what is, what is God saying, and what do you want us to pray for? And those of you who were there, remember I said two things. One, the Lord told me that I will be wounded in the house of a friend. And I could tell some people dropped their heads. Some said, don't say that. And out of respect, I didn't say what I was thinking. But it's, I didn't say it. God said it. And he told me this. And it's okay. If it happens, 
God has already told me that it's going to happen. Normally, our wounds don't come from afar off. It comes from close. But God will prepare you so that you won't be bitter and you won't be anxious. And the second thing he said was, rally around John 17 and 21 to be one. And I promise you, in the presence of the God before whom I stand and whom I serve, almost everywhere I go, all, and where everyone is a stranger, when they get up, they talk about a few things, but one is always that we would be one. And so what God is confirming is, I'm saying this in the earth. This is something that I desire because there is so much schism. And I want my church to move from unity to oneness because unity requires agreement. But oneness happens in covenant. We're one because we covenant to be so. How can two walk together except they agree? That's unity. But if I'm in covenant with God, then I'm in covenant with you. The devil likes nothing better than for us to break that covenant, for him to have schism, and for centuries he's been having his way. We say no more because God sees us and he has a work for us. So this young 17-year-old who appeared to be unqualified to do anything but watch sheep, God anoints, and from that day he's king. And I said, God, what can we learn from David's conduct after he got anointed? He said many people would have walked around acting like king, telling people what to do. Look, do you know I'm the king? I was anointed. Ask Samuel. He was there. He was at my consecration service. All my brothers were there. I'm anointed. For 17 years, David served Saul until the day Saul died. David served him. He protected him. He submitted to him. Even though Saul tried to kill him with javelins, he would have been wounded in the house of a friend. But God protected him. And one of the reasons God protected him is because he humbled himself. And he said, I will not touch God's anointed. God took his anointing away from Saul, but David still respected him. He said, because when God is finished with him, It'll be finished. It's not my job. It's not my role. It's not in my authority to take him down. The same God who anointed me will put me on the throne when the day comes. And for 17 years, he served Saul. And on the day that Saul and Jonathan died, he wrote a song saying, how soon are the mighty fall? And he literally wept. Can you imagine weeping? sincerely at the funeral of someone who tried to murder you not just once but multiple times but when we know that God sees us and when God has us regardless of what everyone else says there's a security we become comfortable in our own skin we don't need a position to validate us we don't need a title to validate us. We don't need money to make us feel important. We don't need a certain zip code to make us feel important. If God says, whatever God says I am, that's what I am. It doesn't matter what people think. And people didn't think much of David. Much of it, most people didn't even know who he was. And now there's no one on the face of the earth who doesn't know the name David. Everybody who's born in Israel knows David because the flag that flies over the nation says David. He took him from being in the back. He took him from being overlooked by his father to generations calling him blessed. He's so blessed when a blind man was on the side of the road and he heard Jesus was passing by. He said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. 
And even him, they said, be quiet. Stop. Don't bother the master. But elder, the closer Jesus got, the louder he got. Oh my God, I pray that the day would come where we would sense his presence so much that as he walks up and down, the closer he gets to you, the louder you would get. Crying out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I want you to know, stand with me. I want you to know with the accuracy of Samuel's prophets, the one who God never let his words fall to the ground, they always came to pass that God sees you. He sees you. He was overlooked by his father, but God saw him. Some of you have been overlooked, not just in your father's house, but it feels like the recognition that you have earned and deserved, you're not getting. Don't be discouraged. Be encouraged. Because the God who looks at us from the inside and not the outside, who's not impressed by credentials, he's not impressed by the things that the world measures and calls success. He told me to tell you he's got you. And he's got a plan for you. He's got a future for you. He has things. His, he's hopeful toward your future. And he wants you to be hopeful for your future. And he said, be not dismayed. Don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. I see you. And the day will come. The day will come. The day will come. And it will come speedily that it will be clear why you have gone through what you're going, you've gone through. He's, he's allowing you to deal with lions. He's allowing you to deal with bears. So the day will come that you will be mighty in his army without a formal position, without a formal position. I believe that what God is going to do in these last days are not going to be with people who are popular and well-known, are not going to be with people who are wearing collars and have letters behind their names. They're going to be like David, who are doing things faithfully behind the scenes, who are learning how to, how to do God's work. God is teaching your hands to war. God is going to raise up an army that is going to turn the world upside down. And they're going to be like unto the apostles who the Sadducees or who the Sanhedrin council said, these ignorant and unlearned men. But the one thing they couldn't deny is that they had been with Jesus. I'm talking to every person who's been with Jesus. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. All discouragement we cast out. God is about to do something that will be marvelous in your eyes. Something that you can't imagine. David could not have imagined when that oil was poured on him that for generations his name would be reverenced and that the throne would be established forever and that there was a line that would come through him. See, the first king was from the line of Benjamin and there's never been one on the throne after Saul's death. There's not a drop of blood of Benjamin that's ever been on the throne because God rejected him. You can do the history of the Chronicles of the King. Never has a king on the line of Benjamin sat on the throne after Saul. Here's the other thing God wants us to know. God has given all of us in our hands in our wounds, our loins, in our hands, because some of us don't have children, but in our hands, the legacy of generations are with us. Saul, because of his conduct, no one ever reigned 
Even though he reigned after he was anointed, it was only an appearance. And from that time, never again. David, who was unknown, who was unpopular, who was looked down even in his house, his name has never been forgotten in the earth. And God says, I can do that for anyone that I choose. And that's why I choose the foolish things and the base things to confound the wise. And so I want to especially encourage those of you who feel like you're not getting anywhere, that your best days are behind you, that your time is past. And for the young people who are aspiring and who are emerging, and you feel like you're not where you want to be. Maybe God has refused some things so that you can enter into his destiny. Every eye closed, every head bowed. God, today, we pray that you who looks at the heart would shine a light in our hearts so that we would see ourselves as you see us that we would no longer be defined by the opinions of others, that we would not chase after what appears to be popular and what looks good. God, we want to be good. We want to be found in you. We want to fulfill our purpose in the earth so that when we get to the end of our days, we can say, now it's time for me to be offered up that I have been poured out. Pour us out. May we finish. May we finish. There's some people in the sound of my voice who haven't yet started because they don't know where to start. God, open their eyes. Show us the way. We sincerely come to you for direction. You directed Samuel and even though he was an anointed prophet, in himself he erred, but you corrected him. Correct us, God. You love us just as you love Samuel. Order our steps. Lead us into the way that we should go. God, lead us into our destiny, our corporate destiny together, and our individual purpose. We commit it into your hands. And from this day forward, we walk in it. In Jesus' name we pray, and by him we give thanks. Amen and amen.